Iceland in 1927 by Thorstina Jackson, author of Saga Islendinga in North Dakota, decorated by King Christian of Denmark for this work. Current History, May 1927 Just when the attention of the nations was focused on the armistice, Iceland was granted its autonomy by Denmark on December 1, 1918. The country that had been the last refuge of the liberty-loving nobles of North Europe in their attempt to resist the autocracy of kings before the year 1000 was once more an independent state. The Icelanders were given a new lease on life by this event, which revived the virile spirit of their golden age, and inspired a desire to recreate the days of the Republic from 930 to 1262. The centuries of retrogression were forgotten, as well as the evils of foreign abuse, isolation, and pestilence. A new era had dawned whose watchwords were progress and achievement. The nationalistic movement in Iceland had gradually gained influence from the time when Denmark granted the Icelanders a constitution in 1874, ensuring home rule and free trade. The beginning of the 20th century broke the barrier of isolation by connecting Iceland with the rest of the world by a cable and establishing a network of telephone lines all over the country. This advance was followed by the building of an Icelandic steamship line that was destined to be an important factor in the country's development. It was during the war that the Icelanders fully realized that they could manage their own affairs. Denmark was not in a position to give them much assistance at the time, and thus they had to depend on their own initiative. They prospered through the exorbitant price of fish they exported in large quantities to the British Isles, breaking the German submarine blockade, and carrying on a very profitable trade. Now and then, they paid the penalty of their daring, and were brought face to face with the grim realities of war. Numerous boats were sunk, but the lure of the British pounds, as well as the realization of the great need for their products, made this risky trade a favorite sport of the hardy Icelandic sailors. Iceland widened its markets during the war by engaging in a thriving trade with America. The Icelanders astonished their American business associates by complaining of the wintry blasts off Boston and New York. Not so surprising in the light of the fact that the Icelandic capital, Reykjavik, has a temperature that is never below 2 degrees Fahrenheit, and the north coast on the rim of the Arctic Circle is not colder than Chicago. Increased prosperity and more varied activities stimulated the growth of the nationalistic party, and taking advantage of the chaos in Europe, the nation began to bring pressure to bear upon Denmark for more liberty, which finally culminated in the Treaty of 1918, giving the Icelanders the status of a nation with a right to fly their own flag. Later, they joined the League of Nations as an independent state. The country recognizes the King of Denmark as chief executive, but the affairs of the land are in the hands of a parliament, a premier, and a cabinet. The Icelandic fleet consists of two battleships, Thor and Odin, the chief occupation of which is to guard against foreign trawlers fishing within the prescribed limits. These two boats are record breakers in capturing foreign encroachers. The usual fine is 1,000 pounds, all equipment, and fish. Recently, a complaint was made in the British Parliament relating to the exorbitant fines that British fishermen had to pay to the Icelanders, but the injured fishermen were informed that it was not the policy of Great Britain to encourage lawbreaking. Therefore, if their trawlers were captured for overstepping their rights, they would have to abide by the consequences. The Icelanders place all the money received through these fines in a fund for building a fleet of patrol boats. Thus, if the Thor and the Odin, now the sum total of their fleet, continue their activities with as much vim as in the past, Iceland will soon be guarded by all the Norse gods in the guise of police patrol boats. The idea is prevalent that the Icelanders are on the whole serious and melancholy, whereas on the contrary, they have a liberal allowance of Celtic humor that blends very well with the perseverance and poise of the Norse strain. They are prone to quarrel among themselves in true Celtic fashion, but seldom carry such quarrels to excess, for the nation is very law-abiding. They generally limit themselves to verbal tirades, which the picturesque Icelandic renders very effective. Many possess the gift of poetry, and the quantity of ironic verse ridiculing and abusing opponents in community disagreements would fill volumes. Some of this spontaneous poetry is very ably set forth, but unfortunately so saturated with local color as to be untranslatable. However, the practical Norse side of the Icelanders causes them to recognize the value of cooperation, as is exemplified by the success of their cooperative stores. The classic literature of Iceland has always been essentially the property of the common people, and therefore the country has never developed an illiterate peasant class. 
In fact, many of the finest literary gems in the country have been and are produced by the farmers. It is a well-known fact that when the academically trained Icelander wishes to write the most classic style, he endeavors to copy the everyday diction of the farmer. The badstofa, or living room, in the country homes in Iceland has been the strongest factor in preserving the language unchanged, as well as in maintaining the exceptionally high literary standard of the people in general. It is there that the most intimate picture of Icelandic home life is to be found, especially during the dusky winter afternoons and evenings. There, the family assembles, and each person has his or her appointed tasks. The women sew, knit, spin, and do fancy work, while the men card wool, make, and mend tools. One person, who is the reader of the household, has a seat of honor directly underneath the lamp. He reads from ancient and modern Icelandic literature, and often translates Danish books by sight. English books are not uncommon in the Icelandic homes. The very nature of the Icelandic language is such that it is easy for the people to acquire other languages. Sometimes the entertainer sings one of the numerous Icelandic ballads, and the audience joins in the refrain, the women working their spinning wheels in time to the music. It is in the living room that Icelandic youth receives its most effective training in the literature of the country, and the influence is noticeable in the ordinary speech of the children, which is singularly free from slang. This reading is not superficial, as is proved by the fact that the reader halts frequently, permitting the book to fall on his lap, and immediately there arises a lively discussion as to the subject matter. The Icelander delights in arguments, and many and varied are the opinions expressed in this oral analysis. In the majority of cases, this gathering in the living room is brought to a close by family worship. A passage is read from the Bible, or a book of sermons, and the people join in singing hymns. The towns of Iceland are well equipped with schools, but in the country districts, the elementary education is carried out in the home, and the mothers are the chief instructors. A traveling tutor usually spends about six weeks on each farm during the winter. It is worthy of note that children in the country communities are ready for high school and comparatively as well prepared as American children of the same age. No class in Iceland is as essentially Icelandic as the farmers. They are first and foremost individualists. They are not particularly progressive in their calling, but they seem to know the art of obtaining the greatest amount of comfort and happiness out of their environment. The Icelandic farmer is a wide reader, and his interests extend far beyond his homestead. The writer made a cross-country horseback tour of Iceland, and enjoyed the privilege of meeting many people in the country communities. She arrived one evening at a farmhouse, after perhaps ten hours of riding across mountains and moors, inhaling the exhilarating air of the north. The first task of her hosts was to satisfy a very keen appetite by the many excellent dishes for which the Icelandic housewife is justly famed. Ability to speak the language broke the restraint that foreigners feel at first, and after a most satisfying meal, the host began to put her through a species of third degree. You come from a wonderful country, but isn't your population growing too fast? Have you really pitched your tents over there? Do many people believe it was Leifur Erikson who discovered America? I understand that they have an Icelandic library of 15,000 volumes at Cornell. Do you think many people read those books? Of the American presidents, Lincoln and Roosevelt are the most popular. A biography of the former has just appeared in Icelandic, a volume of considerable size, and this book seemed to be in almost every home visited. The radio makes a strong appeal to the Icelandic farmers, and they are confident that it is going to be an important force in overcoming the handicaps of isolation. Iceland with a population of 100,000 has two main ways of gaining a living, farming and fishing. During the last few years, fishing has become a leading industry, and the yearly export has reached as high as 70 million crowns yearly. Geologically, the country has not been much explored, and therefore little is known about probable raw materials. The Icelandic farmer is beginning to show signs of desiring to improve his land so as to have large herds of cattle and sheep the only practicable farming in Iceland on account of the lack of summer heat, which prevents grain from being cultivated to any extent, although the soil is excellent. A large area of wasteland could be cultivated if modern scientific methods were introduced. The numerous hot springs are another potential factor in the development of the country. Some are already being used for heating certain municipal buildings, swimming pools, hothouses, and so forth. A plan is being considered for establishing a central heating system in Reykjavik, a city of 25,000 inhabitants, and using the hot springs as a source of heat. 
By doing that, it is estimated that the saving will be equal to 20,000 tons of fuel annually. Icelandic water power is, however, the greatest potential element in the development of Iceland. The country has 4 million horsepower, and of that, only 4,000 are in use, principally to light Reykjavik and the leading towns. A number of farmers are making their own installations from a nearby fall or river, thus using electricity for cooking, lighting, and heating purposes in their homes. One advantage that Icelandic water power possesses is a uniformity of flow, owing to the slight changes in the summer and winter temperature. Viewed from the standpoint of industry, the excellent harbors of the country, which are open all year, facilitate transportation. The Icelanders are in favor of developing their water power within certain limits, but not to the extent of importing much foreign labor. At the present time, there is not a marked gulf between the employer and employee, at least not so great that they do not take an interest in each other's affairs. The ambition of young Iceland to become a real force in the educational world through a well-developed university specializing in Norse language and literature quite overshadows the desire for economic development. Iceland is logically the place for such an institution, inasmuch as it was there that the Eddas and sagas were recorded, and the native language of today differs only slightly from Old Norse. The present university has a strong faculty, men educated abroad as well as in their own country. And proportionately to the population, it has a large student body, but the buildings and all equipment are in a most discouraging state of insufficiency. The dream of Iceland is to see this condition improved, and to establish an educational center that will encourage foreigners to come and take graduate work in Norse literature and language, as well as permit Iceland to employ instructors in numerous technical fields. The university faculty is also desirous of erecting an institute of genealogy and genetics. In all probability, no nation has as much material on the history of her children as the Icelanders. Genealogy has been their favorite hobby ever since the saga period. A massive material has been compiled on the subject, and the history of certain families written for century after century with painstaking care. It is possible to trace the history of every Icelander to the early 18th century, and the majority to the colonial days, that is, a thousand years. The Icelandic educationalists maintain that such an institution would be an invaluable asset, that it would serve not only as a reliable doomsday book of the Icelandic nation, but would also be of marked importance to the student of anthropology, and become a basis for reaching conclusions as to the acquired and inherited traits and tendencies of the race. Icelandic art has begun to assert itself recently. Increased leisure and opportunity have given a great stimulus to that phase of Icelandic culture. At present, Iceland has a renowned sculptor, Einar Jonsson, in whose museum are to be found what critics in many parts of the world call poems in stone. There are other less famous exponents of Icelandic art, among them painters, sculptors, and woodcarvers. In 1930, Iceland is planning to celebrate the thousand years of its Althing, or parliament, established in June 930. It is significant that this millennial jubilee comes at a time when there are many signs of advancement in the country, 